So this presentation is the very last sort of unit in economics, which probably actually is the most important with regards to paper two. I'll try and explain why, but it's the section on unit uh, 4.10, Economic Growth and Development Strategies. Now, you remember when you've looked at paper two, um, the model seems to be now that uh, the case studies that are shown in paper two are from developing countries. I haven't seen one yet, and I know there's only been a year or so of papers that has looked at a developed country. That's important because the question G, which is the 15 mark question on paper two, is going to ask you about growth and development um, policies. It might use the word policies, but strategies, things the government might do in order to achieve an improvement in growth and development in that country. Uh, one thing is you must make sure you make a clear distinction between what economic growth is and what development is. But the second thing is context. Uh, the, the context of a developing country is totally different to the economic context of a developed country. So if you start to use uh, information from primarily unit three, macroeconomics, fiscal monetary supply side, you're probably not going to address the key question of this particular case study. What you need to concentrate on, and there's a whole list of things here in our subject guides, of strategies or policies that a developing country can use in order to achieve economic growth, development, and prosperity. Right, there's, I don't know, 10, 12 here, maybe more than that. Um, now, many of them you've come across in different units. So you come across things like privatization and deregulation. You know, you've seen those uh, in other units. Um, you've even talked about economic integration here uh, in unit uh, four, um, provision of merit goods. I mean, they're not unfamiliar terms to us, but what you must make sure is that you answer your question, taking a lot of information from the text uh, based around these particular policies. So familiarize yourself with it. Um, we've got a list here. We've got another list here uh, of strategies or policies that a, a developing country might take. I mean, on these <clears throat> slides to come, I've highlighted a few of them, but I'm not going into all of them in great detail. I mean, there's, already, you know, there's a lot of information. But one of the sort of key areas is trade, and you might see a reference to the fact that the country has introduced, I don't know, a, free, a freer trade approach to its neighbours. And many people are then tempted just to draw the tariff diagram and show a reduction in the tariff and sort of do a traditional sort of tariff um, approach to this question, which is sort of fine. But again, remember here with uh, the sort of developing countries that we're referring to, uh, the language of trade strategies is a little bit different. You know, we're talking about these areas, import substitution strategy, a policy, an export promotion policy, trade liberalization as a free trade um, is a particular strategy that they might follow. So you need to use the language of trade strategies in order to do well. All right. So here's a little reference to import substitution. I mean, you can pause the video and sort of read these uh, rather than me sort of read them out, which take a considerable amount of time. Export promotion, like what does it mean? Why is it beneficial? I've put page references to the Trigatis uh, textbook here along the way. Trade liberalization, what it is. So, so, you know, what happened over the last few years is that developing countries were being pushed by what was called the Washington Consensus in the early 90s, which was a general view that the free market really was the approach that a developing country should take. So the developed world through the World Bank and the WTO, the IMF, were sort of pushing this agenda, which became known as the Washington Consensus, to try and promote free trade and deregulation and what have you so you've got those sort of things going on um as well in terms of pushing trade liberalization but it's not necessarily the best for everybody there's a slide on the role of the wto in that different regional trade agreements you know um a lot of the work you did on the european union customs unions you know you can bring into these sort of bilateral and regional trade uh, agreements that <clears throat> many countries in africa adopt and diversification is the, is the last of the part of it where 
we recognise that having a very limited range of exports, and particularly if they're limited to sort of primary goods, is not healthy for a developing country to improve its economic growth and standard of living. So diversification is important for them. <clears throat> uh, there's a little section on foreign aid and humanitarian aid, um, and what it is and you know where it comes from. Uh, reasons to give aid are not all economic necessarily. There's a mixture of humanitarian political motives that come into play as well. And the fact that you know countries are getting disillusioned um, with aid uh, we have for many years now um, people like Dambisa Moya uh, who is suggesting that aid, her famous book of maybe 2010 was called Dead Aid and she put forward the view that you know really we need to stop giving aid to Africa um, with a view to, because uh, it's stifling, it hasn't, it's been going on for 50 years but there's no, not been any significant progress and, and she feels that Africa uh, and the developed world as well need to sort of take responsibility for uh, the fact that things have not significantly improved. Plus, people in developed countries get weary of giving aid. You know, they have their, they sort of say, you know, they've got their own problems uh, to deal with. Uh, foreign direct investment is a reference to multinationals. So it's a big thing with uh, developing country strategies to allow or not to allow multinationals in often their hands are sort of forced by the multinational um, the country sort of needs they're competing for multinational uh, investment in their countries um, some examples of multinationals there um, but there's certain things that attract them of course uh, low costs uh, fewer regulations restrictions um, are all attractive features of many of these developing countries um, and you know if you focus on africa that's where the big uh, push has been in recent years, and particularly from China, there's a lot of multinational investment now uh, finding its way into Africa f uh, from uh, Chinese uh, companies. There's arguments for look, this reference to the savings gap and the um, foreign exchange gap, uh, there's a savings gap, foreign exchange gap, come into a number of the arguments and strategies that a developing country can use uh, because they simply don't have enough savings to encourage investment. They don't have enough foreign exchange through the sale of their exports uh, to finance purchase of imports. So multinationals can help fill those gaps that they've got. There's some arguments against. <clears throat> um, transfer pricing is a big one where multinationals can avoid paying tax through the way that they manage the um, prices and their costs of production in different countries. And... You know, there's many reasons to feel that multinationals are not particularly beneficial. Transfer pricing or section on it there. Social enterprises have become sort of uh, increasingly common. Uh, they've got social goals. They tend to be cooperatives, uh, organizations that are trying to bring people together to help each other out in different areas, whether it's you know coffee, sale of coffee or cocoa or something like that. And microfinance, familiarize yourself with what that is and what the purpose of microfinance was. Um, and then we've got market-based or interventionist policies. Um, so again, this is a very common question. Like, should a developing country go down the market route or the interventionist route? Interventionist being, you know, sort of government involvement in that economy. Uh, it's often, you know, the answer is not clear cut. Uh, again, there's arguments for and against the balance between the two. And in our subject, guys, what we've got here is strengths and weaknesses of a market-oriented approach, looking at these strengths, amongst others, but these are the ones that your subject guide identifies and the various weaknesses of a free market approach. Um, again, you can see here the development of dual economy, formal and informal. Like we never refer to that with a developed country. So it is a unique problem of... Um, a um, developing country. Um, here's some of the further strengths and weaknesses uh, shown, and here's the interventionist policies, uh, strengths of those, and the weaknesses of intervening in the in the economy. Um, corruption here is again a big issue in many developing countries, and has been and continues to be 
a problem. Um, multilateral development assistance through organizations that know about the World Bank, uh, the IMF, what their job is um, and what contribution they make. And then the final slide here is just giving you a list of other what is referred to as institutional changes. So again, strategies still, policies, the governments can do something about trying to encourage you know, the banking sector, uh, women's empowerment, reducing corruption, property rights and land rights, you know, give opportunities for people then to use their land for collateral, to expand, invest, borrow money, etc. Right. So a huge topic, but really important that you get to grips with it uh, for paper two. Thank you.